I'll just put that you get back to you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'll read out the bit that I've got to remind you about everything. This meeting this evening will be live streamed to the public. So remember, whatever you say, the public will be able to hear later on this week. Please ensure you've scanned the QR code poster before entering the meeting. Any exempt private items on the agenda, the live stream will cease prior to the meeting moving into private. There might be a short delay. A recording of the public part of the meeting will be available on the Council's website within 24 hours of the meeting. Attendees are required to wear masks on entry to the building and meeting room, but may remove them when seated. Would members and officers please remember to switch their microphone on when speaking and speak directly into the microphone? I find that a bit difficult for me up here because I'm sitting here and the mic is there. <laughs> so hopefully. Any officers that are called upon by the portfolio holders should address the executive. Oh, sorry, that's, that's the executive. Can you please make sure you switch off mobile phones or put them on silent mode? And could I ask the officers, anyone when they're speaking, to remove the mask? It makes it easier for everybody he to hear. Thank you. Right, we'll start the meeting. Apologies for absence. Chair, apologies received from Councillors Pets and Adblick Chair. Minutes. Minutes are before you, Chair. Right. Are the minutes accurate? Attendance is missing. I was present at the last meeting. Yes, so, you were. Thank yeah, you but it doesn't that. reflect on the minute. Can you make sure that it goes on to my report? Because that's the second time, hasn't it? Yeah, it's the second time. Yeah. Thank you. Accept the minutes with that amendment. With that minimum amendment. Yes. yes. Private will do it. Private will do at the end. There's no chairs update. Disclosures, are there any disclosures? Urgent business? No urgent business, Chair. References? There are no references, Chair. Right. The first one is item seven, LBC Corporate Quarterly Performance Report for 2020 to 2021, quarter three and four. Zoe, you're doing the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Zoe Bulmer. I'm the Business Intelligence Manager and I'm joined by Aurora Dunn, who's one of our analysts who will be doing the presentation um, and she'll be presenting it for the whole of last year and then the new report for quarter one for this year. Um, and apologies, we've not been in this room before to present. So if we if we get something wrong, please tell us. So apologies in advance. I'll hand over to Aurora. Thank you. So to begin with, the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown restrictions have had a severe impact across services. Because of this, it is difficult to draw any meaningful comparisons and conclusions from the performance figures for last year and quarter one of this year. And in addition, many of the education related measures are blank due to the government cancelling exams. There are a couple of areas in the report without figures, but I have now received the data and will send out an updated report. A number of areas of improvement for the report have been highlighted by the chair, and these include adjusting the font size and adding an R, A or G for each KPI so that the report is easier to read when it's printed out in black and white. Going forward, a red report focusing on KPIs with poor performance will be added to the main report. In addition, due to difficulties obtaining up-to-date national data, any NHS KPIs whose data won't be available until next year will be removed from the report. Officers will also be meeting with the service with the aim of expanding the reducing net carbon emissions section of the report. 
So the RAG rating for the year and corporate performance measures are as follows. 10 are green, 2 are amber and 20 are red. The majority of indicators are below target for last year. These include London Luton Airport passenger numbers. Unsurprisingly, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the aviation industry. As restrictions lifted in the second quarter, London Luton Airport was the fastest recovering UK airport. But as restrictions were again imposed during quarters three and four, those numbers dropped again from 589,320 in quarter three to 309,356 in quarter four. Number of children adopted from care. During quarter four, nine children were adopted from care against a target of 19. This is in keeping with national and regional trends which show adoption numbers have been steadily decreasing since 2015. Also, waiting times for care packages provided within four weeks after assessment. Year-end performance in this area stands at 77.3% against a target of 90%. Recent introduction of the Coronavirus Act 2020 brought discharge to assess duty to, onto the local authorities, and as a result, there are service users going into health-funded beds waiting to be assessed for long-term needs. The service is conducting a thorough review into this area of poor performance. On a positive note, it should be noted that the Children's Services has achieved the corporate target to convert or replace 13 a agency social workers by February 2021 through the Social Work Academy. Services are now working towards the last corporate objective, which is to have a 10% agency for the overall workforce by February 2022. So for quarter one of 2021, the RAG rating is as follows. 14 KPIs are green, none are amber and 12 are red. The majority of indicators are above target. But areas for improvement include London Luton Airport passenger numbers. Passenger figures for the first quarter of 2021 are at 5.42 million, is below the quarterly target of 5.90 million. But it does show a slow but steady improvement month on month. The recovery for passenger numbers post COVID-19 is forecast to reach pre-pandemic levels around 2024. Town centre vibrancy or town centre footfall. The quarter one figure is 1.52 million against a target of 3.53 million. Due to difficulties in obtaining data, services are currently reviewing this KPI with the aim of providing a more complete picture of town centre vibrancy. And the other measure, number of affordable new homes completed. No affordable new homes were completed during quarter one. This is due to the nature of house building, which is long term and has many stops and starts. Are there any questions? Can I say that Aurora has included, has in what she's been saying is year 2021 and then the report for this year, the first quarter, I noticed some of you were sort of looking a little bit puzzled as what she was saying, but that was what she did. Second half was on the first quarter. Hope that helps. Um, councillor, we, we had a discussion earlier and we'll do a PowerPoint for the next meeting to make it easier. So, so councillors are not having to search around for it. So we apologise we haven't done that this time. Any questions? Um, just a couple of points, if I may, Chair. Yes, David. Um, I, I think the, the sort of highlights that came through to me, at least from the report, were the fact that the performance of the planning team seems to have been particularly good in terms of the, the reports that I could see, in terms of um, getting through the work on time. And I was pleased to see that. Um, the a worrying fact, I think a lot of the report, to be honest, um, I spent a lot of time going through it, but given the impacts of COVID, I'm not sure that it was 
as useful as it may have been. And that's no reflection on the report, by the way. Um, that's just the fact that it's um, so much influenced by COVID. And I think that was a bit unfortunate because it tended to distract, I thought, from the quality of the report. And that's not a criticism, it's just what I think is a statement of fact. I found exactly the same, David. Um, the, there was one thing which I picked out which I thought was a little bit worrying, which is that we seem to have gone dramatically backwards in terms of the number of apprentices. Um, I, I tend to feel that, it, particularly in Newton with the workforce we've got, that apprenticeships are an important factor. And it seems to me, Chair, that we, we've gone backwards in respect of apprenticeships. Um, if you just bear with me a second, because there's quite a lot of the reports. Um, I also thought particularly good was the movement we we're making in children's social care. Um, as a council, I believe that we go backwards consistently in terms of the amount of resources we put into children's social care. But at least with having more of our permanent staff, I think it was encouraging the fact that we stand a better chance of using the reducing resources better. Those were my comments for this time, Chair. Yeah, not questions, Chair, I'm sorry, but more comments. Um, it, I, I echo everything that uh, David Wynne has said. The, the the report is is frankly pretty meaningless because of the circumstances in which it's been produced, which is a pity because a lot of hard work goes into it. Nevertheless, um, but there are some some general comments. Um, three, I think, in particular. One uh, on well, the first on page fourteen, the percentage of decent streets with litter is a figure I never had believed. Well, whenever it's it's produced. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, maybe the people who compile this or actually do the inspections might like to come along to Bradgers Hill Road at lunchtime, where we have Stopsley High School at one end of the road and Sixth Form College at the other end of the road, uh, and where the residents busily go along after the lunch break clearing up all the litter. That's why there isn't much litter there. It's not because the council is good at preventing it from being dumped or from clearing it up, because the residents don't like living knee deep in other people's rubbish. Um, so I, I, there's, there's huge room for improvement. And, and the amount of junk that you see lying about, I, I've driven down Cromwell Hill three times this week, and the number of mattresses lying on the pavement has increased every time I go down there. Um, so. I, I just don't believe that at all. Um, the, the next one down, I'm not going to take you through line by line all these, I promise you, but the next one down, town centre footfall, uh, if there is to be any hope at all of getting back to a sensible level of footfall in the town centre, then some drastic action is required. I'm constantly encountering people who now tell me they never, ever, go into Luton Town Centre. And I know why. Because it, the only people that seem to occupy it are either drunk or begging. And the council recently, the executive uh, report that extended the public spaces protection order came to this committee before it went to the executive. We fully supported extending it but asked the executive to note that more resources were required to make the town centre an attractive place to be. I don't see any sign of that happening anytime soon, but it's needed. Um, the, the only other comment I've got to make is regarding um, the children's social services, where um, I, I'm relieved to have learned in the last few days that the children's services scrutiny group is keeping a very, very close eye on the progress following the awful Ofsted report. Um, so we have got at least an assurance that the scrutiny group there is keeping a careful eye on what's going on. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, David. I've got one, and 
I sort of brought it up at lunchtime, is the reducing net carbon emissions. Now, I th think that is a very crucial thing for this town and not be, to be able to get sort of figures that we've, you know, that we need to actually, you know, um, have you, did you have any thoughts about changing that or, or talking to various people? Zoe? Ah, yeah. So um, when we were developing the report, um, um, this was an area that we really wanted to um, increase reporting on, and we, we acknowledged that we probably would need to come back to this. I think the um, officers have been quite ambitious in including areas that are challenging to report, and so probably that they want to report on it, but they can't yet report on it. And I think there's we need to go back and um, I hear your, your comments that we need to go back and think about things we can report on now, as well as things that we, we know we need to start reporting on in the future. So I'm Myself and Aurora will meet with the team. We'll we'll discuss the concerns that are raised, and we'll try to think about, um, um, in a more practical, solid sense, what we can actually report on and how we're going to take this forward. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wondered if it would be helpful just for me to add something to what uh, Sorry said. So, um, because obviously this is my area of responsibility, um, we are uh, looking at trying to gather information and uh, data. It's quite a technical area and we don't have, um, at the moment, we don't have a way of calculating carbon, which is what we need for some of our projects. But it is an area that we're working uh, with the LGA, looking at what they're doing because they've got a carbon accounting tool. So uh, we will be developing this in the future. We've just, there's an awful lot of, of work around it, but I just wanted to sort of reassure the committee that that will be information which should be available. I can't give you a time scale, I'm afraid, at the moment, though. Thanks, I just wanted to reiterate in a way what David said about the town centre footfall. Um, we had, uh, I think it was our last meeting when we had the presentation of the future of the town centre in the next 30, 40 years. When you look at these figures, the footfall really has basically gone from 4 million to 2 million. Now, if it's gone from 4 million to 2 million, you can tell that a high proportion of that 2 million will be people that have to go to the town centre, i.e. live there or whatever. So the actual drop in people from outside of the town centre going to the town centre will be more than 50 percent. It'll probably be about 75 percent. And my, you know, my concern is, is the council really aware of it? I mean, it's obvious that there's going to be more shops closed. You can't have a 50 percent fall in football, footfall and these shops survive. So even more are going to go. And one of the things that I'm picking up more and more from people is that we we tend to look at things like um, uh, people say about, which is right, the beggars and the litter, but it's just the dirt that a number of people have said to me. You look at the pavements, you look at the state of the place, the people just say, I won't go there anymore. And what worries me is we've got a 30, 40 year plan, but by the time we get to that stage, it would just the whole nature of the place will have become irreplevably um, changed. And I, I, I really do think this council should have some form of sort of emergency committee and emergency plan sort of that's meeting monthly to deal with what's happening in the town centre and more focus on that because I just feel when you look at this it sums up what's going to happen and it's virtually on the point of collapse in my view. That's what can I ask I'm not sure if you can answer it Nicola was it right on the television that Luton Scott is bidding for some money to work on the town centre have we got that money is my question or is it <laughs> no no we haven't haven't got it yet it's the leveling up fund yes that money yeah so so the government are going to determine the outcome of that in the comprehensive spending review on the 27th of october so we won't know if luton's bid will be successful and we're looking at other opportunities to, to bring in investment into the town centre as well. So um, I think it is a, it is a bit of a, a watching game. However, the points made around the cleanliness of the town centre, they can't wait. And we're looking no. as officers working with the portfolio holder and members, looking at how we can fast track some further investment into those basic street cleansing services, because 
you know, it, you're, you're correct in that, you know, it, there is litter. We do need to look at the cleanliness. There are antisocial behaviour problems. We are liaising with the police around that to look at how we can target our resources better. So, so that those those points are, are well made, and um, we're alive to those and looking at not in an emergency way, as, as Councillor Chapman suggested, but looking at how we can fast track some some additional resource into that, um, and looking at how we reprioritise, um, because I think. Um, you know, it's a significant issue for, for Luton. So, so I think we are we are working on that, and, and Sarah Hall's team is is looking at plans around that and what the investment might be if we went down that particular route. Um, in terms of the, can I can I come in on some of the other things that members have raised? Because yeah, it might be just me. Yeah. I think colleagues who have presented the report might not have some of the answers. So, if I if I go back to Councillor Wynne's point about apprentices, I think that's right. I think we have seen a reduction, but I think that's. Um, because of COVID, in a sense, because we couldn't take on apprentices and work closely, particularly in some of our services, such as BTS, in terms of sharing cabs, working under close supervision. That wasn't permitted at the beginning of COVID. So I th don't think we took on as many. Coming out of COVID, you know, there will be an absolute commitment to developing our approach to apprentices going forward. We see that as, you know, a really good route into, into, into local government. Um, you know, we know we've got an ageing workforce at Luton Council. And those of you that sit on admin and regulation committee will know that we've got a lot of 50 pluses. And actually, it doesn't appear to be about back in the day. It was a young person's game, local government. It's not anymore. So we've got to get our apprentices through um, because it is a good career. And, and we've got a many and varied kind of options with it within local government. So so that there is a commitment to, 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 to that um, going going forward. The children's social care improvements, I think that's right. I think there has been lots of work. I mean, I, I led a piece of work for a year around looking at how we fast track um, social workers in. How do we make it an attractive offer? We've got the, um, the Social Work Academy now uh, and bringing in cohorts and, and building that experience. Um, so that, that's positive. And we want those people to remain in Luton as well. So, so I think we've got the foundations there of a, a good solid workforce com coming through, but we've got to keep at it. If you if you drop the ball just for a minute on children's social work, as you know, you know, you can't. It is it, it, it's, it's continuous work to keep to keep um, those social workers interested in ensuring that our offers right, that our caseloads are right, that they're getting the right um, supervision, coaching, mentoring um, to build their careers in Luton. So, so that is working in the right direction. Um, the litter, I think, is, is the point um, well made by Councillor um, Franks. I think we are seeing litter across the town and we've got the litter strategy and we're looking at ways of, around how we are more, um, what's the word I'm thinking, more direct and putting resources in into, into um, enforcement and prevention and education. And you would have heard Jennifer Wyatt at a previous meeting talking about that um, and looking at good practice from, from other areas. So that is a piece of work underway, but, it, but it's against a, a significant problem that we have in, have in Luton. So it's not going to be solved overnight and it will require all of us to... to to be involved and you'll know this week is around we're in the great um the great green week aren't we so there is lots of community litter litter work happening lots of good things happening around um climate change and, and our, our carbon footprint that are in the public domain but you will see through social media that our citizens are getting more active um, around picking up around educating their streets and really taking pride and that's excellent and I think we need to see, need to see more of that um, which is good. Um, town centre footfall we are measuring it um, I think going forward the master plan will be our blueprint for a new town centre which will be a mixture of retail office leisure um, and, and homes um, and and we will see different type of football in the town centre. Um, but at the moment, it's variable. I mean, I went out there at lunchtime and it was, you know, St. George Street was buzzing. It was really busy. There were people, I didn't go into the mall, but up and down the, the high street, it was really busy. Um, whether those people are spending money in the in the high street, we, we would need to consider that. But, but there was a bit of a buzz today out there and I didn't see any antisocial behaviour while I, I was out there on that occasion but there is 
and we do need to work with our partners in the police to, to, to ensure that our town centre is attractive and nice. Um, and it will change over time as, as the, um, as the uh, master plan is developed. And those funding pots, um, Councillor Pedersen, that you talked about will enable that, that to happen, um, which will be really positive. Um, so that's kind of just answering some of those, those points. Um, but the statistics are helpful, but they're limiting, as, as everyone said, because of, of the nature of, of COVID and, and how they've, how they've come, come forward in the last um, year and a quarter. Can I just make, before we sort of pause this, but I'll come back to you, Peter. Make an observation. I went to St Albans and it wasn't a market day and it looked really scruffy. I was so surprised. I used to work in St Albans and go up to the shop any day during the week and it used to look nice and clean. But the actual pavements were scruffy looking. So I know, Luton, you... Fair enough, it is... You know, only correct that we actually sort of hold Luton up. But as I say, St Albans, take a walk, go across on a non market day and just actually see what it looks like. <laughs> That's my pet project. <laughs> yes, Peter. And on the um, enhanced skills and education, where it's got the children attending a school, which is good or better, um, does that include? academies and free schools? Um, we're not sure I will take that away and find okay. out. The, re take. the reason I ask is obviously, I know, I think all the secondary schools are academies now. Yes, they are. It's important because the, the, there are no high schools in the town before yeah. the council. Mm. Well. No, but there are some free schools and there are some academies. Um, well, personally, I don't really do. It would always be useful to have this figure which says local authority controlled schools, academies, and free schools. Because we can then really judge whether all this thing about, oh, will you get better education here, there, or other, is true or not. At the moment, because we're lumping them in a pot, we may, we may have that all the local authority schools are, are all sort of 90 odd percent are okay, and it's the free schools, whatever. And we can say to our residents, are you aware of this? You know, because I think so that might be something in future, whether it is worth splitting it down so we can see, well, what is the best method? You know, maybe all the free schools are under present, but I don't know. So that, whether we could look at that would be helpful. Yeah, we'll definitely pick that up. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Just one other point, if I may, Chair. Just a, a little observation. Walking down today, coming to this meeting and walking down from Dunstable Place, um, I, I have to say that I happen to notice looking across the town hall from the opposite side of the road, it really looks awful. It's the, the stonework's dirty, it needs a good clean. Um, windows where you could see through them um, have got all sorts of stuff on window ledges. It looks as if the curtains have come from a third rate charity shop. It, it really doesn't set much of an example. If you look from the opposite side of the road, it's awful. My house looked like that. I feel ashamed of it. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you, Zoe and Aurora, for the two reports. Yeah. And the recommendation is that OSB considers the corporate performance summary reports for quarter three and four year end and also for quarter one. Are there any comments that we wish to pass on to the exec? If not, no. Right. That's that one. Now, sorry, I've got lost. Item nine, creating a vision for the Oxford Cambridge Arc consultation report. Good evening, councillors. Um, my name's Sue Frost. I'm the service director for sustainable development. Um, and this report that I'm presenting tonight is a, a report that 
is basically a consultation on uh, the Oxford to Cambridge arc, which members may be aware uh, is a government um, initiative which covers a broad range of local authorities between Oxford and Cambridge. Um, it's effectively an, an area that the government has identified for growth and that it sees has got significant economic potential. Luton sits within the arc, albeit on the very southern boundary of the arc, um, but we do see that we have a role to play in the area. And I think it, it's important to understand that this does present opportunities for Luton because of the potential for economic growth and for increasing jobs and skills and investment in, in infrastructure and housing in the area. So, I mean, it wasn't going to go into detail with regard to the response that we've made, albeit to say that um, this is only the first stage in the government's consultation on what is a, a spatial, what will be a spatial planning document and will form part of the uh, planning framework for Luton eventually, if this document does get does get adopted by the government. And I've set that out in the report because this is another layer of, of effectively planning that we haven't seen in this area for some time. Um, it, it's a new um, effectively regional uh, spatial framework, which we will be required to have regard to when we review our own local plan. So as I said, this consultation is just the first stage in the process. The government want to um, get feedback on what they see as the vision for the area. Um, and we've set out our response to a number of questions set out in the consultation document. They're also consulting on a sustainability appraisal, which is a document which is uh, set out in legislation anyway, and, and which would be required of any spatial planning document like this. Uh, the government's timetable is that they expect to consult on the next stage in the process in spring 2022. Um, and that at that stage, we'll look at options for growth, and that will probably be of more interest to, to the council in terms of looking at where growth may come forward, particularly around Luton, um, that the government would be looking to consult on. And then following that, they'll be producing a further document, a draft document, which would they consult on again, and then finally go to adoption after that. I think the um, the government have got quite an ambitious timescale around this, so it would be quite challenging for them to prepare something within that timescale. Um, so I think probably I'll stop there, Chair, and if there are any questions, I'm just looking really for feedback um, and comments on the response that we've set out so far, which is attached to Appendix 1. Any questions? Yes, David. No, again, I'm sorry, not a question, but uh, a, a comment. At the bottom of page 73, and uh, how do you feel overall about the future of the arc? What are your hopes and fears? Um, I, I, I get constantly irritated by the fact that whilst there are lots and lots of high skilled, high paid jobs around the town, large numbers of the people who fulfill those roles won't live in Luton. I mean, Hertfordshire are constantly complaining about the noise of the airport, um, but they shut up a bit when you remind them that most of the high paid employees at the airport actually live in Hertfordshire. Uh, so I think what I'm saying here is if this is going to the executive, I would feel more comfortable if there wasn't somewhere an ambition to make Luton a place where those who occupy the high skilled and high salary jobs in the town actually want to live. And if this is going to the executive, maybe we could make a recommendation of that kind so that they can somewhere at a suitable place insert that as, a, as an ambition. And they may not want to use those words, um, but so long as it's aiming to achieve the end, I don't care what words are used. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good idea, as, um, in my opinion. Uh, but in terms of um, our own town, our own borough, we have to uh, look at our own benefit first. So um, exactly, I don't know how we're going to proceed uh, with this. Well, uh, we go um, Luton Airport, which is one of the best airport. I mean, this is the fastest growing airport at the moment in our, all over UK. And um, um, uh, we all, we, all, we always uh, talk about you know this is the economy hub. We are uh, uh, Luton is uh, doing really well in terms of jobs and skills and everything, but. In terms of our own benefits, we need a clear picture. So this is what um, uh, my opinion is at the moment. Uh, and I know it's still going through the consultation. A lot to think about this. A lot, uh, and a lot of people are going to uh, talk about this, and there's going to be debate, uh, executive at the council and everywhere. I think in press as well. So we need to look at the benefits of Luton. So they they should come out. Uh, in paperwork somehow. So how are we going to do that to protect our benefits? Um, thank you. I think I'll try, I'll try and answer that question. It's a, um, I think it's an important one and one which we've tried to sort of emphasise in our response at this stage because it's a high level vision. It's quite hard to um, get into specifics about loot and it Precisely, but I think that the next stage in the consultation will be able to perhaps articulate the benefits for Luton in greater detail. And what this doc, what this report doesn't cover is the other work that's going on uh, around a growth deal, which I think is is being looked at separately. And maybe Nicola would like to say something about that as she's more involved in that. Um, but obviously, I'm I'm not. I wasn't going to go into that level of detail with this particular response. I think there are a lot of benefits potentially, but it's difficult for us to see them at this stage in the process. Um, one example could could be if we do get more housing growth in the arc, um, there could be further opportunities for housing for Luton. Um, you know, there's there's jobs growth as well, so potentially our residents could could find uh, jobs in the arc. One of the kind of key planks of this is is inclusive growth, and it is about levelling up um, as part of the government's agenda. So, I think um, there aren't any specific proposals in this document. So it's you know it's not easy to identify specifically how Luton's going to benefit. But I do feel that going forward there will be opportunities for Luton residents to really um, take advantage of this and of being part of the wider arc and, and the prosperity and hopefully that that will bring. I think everybody's saying, which I agree, that a lot of this is dependent on housing. And um, I just wondered under on page 78, I mean, this is it's a damning figure you've included in here, which is 675 three bedroom homes against a need of 13,100. Um, where, where we've got three, the right type of housing to deliver, blah, blah, blah. Would it be possible for us to say we believe that set quotas for types of housing should be included in the plan? I mean, to be fair, I, I know the government would never accept this, but in reality, our housing you know, we should have a quota for certain types of housing in Luton and say, well, you can't build those one bedroom flats because we've got no need for them, but you can build those three bedroom houses. Now, I wonder if this is just a bit of a backdoor route where we can say we feel this whole plan is at risk because of lack of quotas for housing type and no control over the type of housing. Because you're just saying at the moment, any housing that's built in Luton isn't for Luton people. It's not for Luton people at all. It's not for dealing with kids of Luton people. It's all dealing with either people without families moving in mostly, or actually building speculative flats, which end up being tenanted as totally un unsuitable accommodation for families that have been rammed into them because there's nothing else available. So I just wondered whether we could put something about, we believe set quotas should be set for types of housing as part of this plan. 
I think that's a really valid point, actually. Um, I think at this stage, it's going to be difficult to weave that into the vision. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think maybe the, a comment around um, the housing type and mix made more strongly is is worth doing. Um, just perhaps worth clarifying that this won't override our own local plan, but we will need to have regard to it when, when we're preparing our own local plan review. And obviously we'll be setting policies around housing mix and, that, and that'll be a piece of work that we do going forward. Um, but I take your point and, and it is one that's well made. And I think one of the things we have tried to do in this response is although the, there's a pushing with this document for brownfield sites first not greenfield sites um, which on one level is the right thing to do i think it's got to be um, done in a way that doesn't compromise towns like luton where there are already um, as you said a, a lot of one bedroom two bedroom properties we we need you know more development of three three four bedroom properties probably um and the issue we've got is, is that quite often brownfield sites are quite difficult to develop um and it's not profitable to build a lower number of properties so i think may maybe emphasizing that a little bit more um within some of the responses um is something we could do just to find point that I know it is difficult, but I, I think even three bed flats and maisonettes would be a some sort of move in encouraging developers to at least do that. You see all these families, I've seen them everywhere you go. You know, there's where there's you can see families are squ squashed into two bed flats. They've got nowhere else to go. And we're not going to provide any else for them. So I just think um that idea of quota. The reason I think it might be worth putting it in the arc is I don't feel the government's ever going to listen to the borough council and our plan they're not interested but maybe they are interested in this arc and therefore if we sort of said as part of the arc it's that there are more guidance on the type of housing to support the arc they might listen to that more than they'll ever listen to luton borough thanks anyway uh, thank you very much here um uh, just one follow on point from uh, what Councillor Malik has said with regards to the benefits for Luton. Um, it's really important that we emphasise um, in our responses that Luton should be treated as an equal partner to the rest of the areas uh, because it's important that Luton doesn't lose its voice. So whatever the investments, uh, opportunities are, jobs, housing, etc., that Luton you know, is considered on the same par or the same level playing field um, as given to the other areas of which there will be significantly bigger cities um, involved so you know it's really important that we emphasize we're going to be treated equally uh, you know to the rest of our partners within the area uh, but it's a good idea but you know Luton's you know it's important that Luton you know gets its level playing field um, and gets the benefits that we need um, on par with everybody else. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Just um, like, like to make a couple of points. Um, first of all, um, I welcome the report and uh, uh, pleased about the being part of, uh, potentially part of a uh, future arc. And uh, the, the point um, my fellow councillor made, uh, but just now uh, about the benefits of the Luton, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, what David uh, Frank was saying early on, uh, we uh, um, can't force other people to live in Luton, the high paid working people at the airport but what we need to do we need to encourage and develop our own people the resident of luton to get up on that level so uh, i think we should be uh, more academies uh, training and apprenticeships that, that, that our people our young children can achieve that high level high paid jobs so we need to do something that, that our own people that those who are living in luton rather than those who are working and should live in luton but rather than who are living in luton should work at the airport and um, you know benefit for the luton uh, and obviously more future further benefits thank you thank you councillor win Yes, thank you. It, it's following the same things. I, I entirely agree 
that we need to make sure that Newton gets its fair shout, if I want to put it those terms, so I entirely agree. I, I do feel that when I look, as, as David Franks did, at page 78, when you get answers against the housing like very important, um, that's much too shallow. Um, I, if, if I can also make one other point, which is that I see too often um, this term affordable housing being used. Affordable housing to me is a complete cop out. Um, we mostly the so-called affordable housing doesn't turn out to be affordable. Um, I, I think we have to push to make sure that, and it is happening in some parts of the country, um, that we actually get back into providing um, good quality social housing. Um, and the, the comments that, that uh, Councillor Chapman made about um, the types of housing, even in brownfield sites, it is not beyond the will of man to actually make perfectly acceptable family housing on a brownfield site if it is being done as truly um, social housing and truly affordable housing and you can have groups of houses you can have them around a green area you can have them so that they develop their own community you can never get a community and a dirty great big block of flats and if you want to see an example of that just go down and look at what they're building down there on napier park Thank you very much. Just uh, like to add on, uh, uh, as Councillor Kashif just uh, uh, mentioned. So one of our man man aim is local resources for local people, local jobs for local people, and uh, we've been working on this in the in the past years. So uh, in terms of this, we need to look at this as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, complaints coming from many parts of our community, from yeah, youth as well. Uh, they are all underrepresented already uh, at the airport and in other um, um, issues. So uh, in terms of that, we have to, uh, uh, when we talk about the benefit of Lutons, I think we need to think about the benefit of our people as well, like uh, how they think, how uh, they're going to, um, I mean, achieve, how we're going to achieve our goals in uh, different institutes like Luther Barrett Council, LNT, airport, university. So our aim, which which is still local people, uh, local jobs for local people and local resources for local people, are we uh, actually um, getting that goal or not? Sorry, I'm not, I didn't catch all of that, but um, is it local jobs for local people is the kind of key key question. And I think absolutely um, it's, it's really important that we try and provide jobs within the town and, and high quality jobs within the town for local people. Um, and I think being part of the ARC and our response to the ARC, we, we, we probably could emphasise that more as well. Um, particularly as we go forward when they start to identify potential areas for employment growth um, but of course that is also a, a an area that we want to deal with in our local plan review as well so there'll be you know further work done around that for the local plan um, as we go forward but all these things can be emphasized in our response I think um, and I think I just coming back on some of the points that have been made. Um, we have sort of in the introduction section emphasised what Lut the Luton 2040 vision is saying. Um, and perhaps we could go a bit further there in terms of emphasising that more um, in terms of being incorporated into the vision. I'll have a look at the wording around that. It, it, it's not, um, so the the consultation is more aimed at members of the public, I think, in terms of the way it's formatted. 
Um, and just to come back on Councillor Wynne's point, so this is a, an online consultation. They're very much trying to encourage people to respond online. Um, and it's some of these questions are multiple choice, hence why um, we put very important, because the only choice, choice of an answer was unimportant, um, important, very important. Um, so we haven't expanded on our, our response there. But where we can expand on our response, we have taken the opportunity to do so. But certainly um, take on board all the comments that members have made tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a silly question, Sue. <laughs> what is the value of an affordable house in Luton? Have we got sort of a span, you know, figure? Because to me, that would be sensible, affordable, somebody in London and somebody, say, in the Outer Hebrides, it would be totally different. So do we have it for each? I, I have the advantage of having a housing colleague um, on the left of me who I'm going to pass this one over to because she'll be able to answer it better than I will. Think. Okay. No, it's a good question. Definition of how affordable housing. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> so uh, there is a planning definition of affordable housing in planning terms, which is when we are uh, looking for affordable housing within a planning um, application. That's guided by that, and the government has amended that a number of times in recent years to incorporate a number of other types of affordable housing products. Most recently, the first homes offer, which is around sort of discounted properties for sale. Um, we have our own ideas of what's affordable um, locally, and that's some of the um, some of the work that we did in our housing strategy set out what, what price points were and how that reflected on against local incomes um, and that's a piece of work that we want to update but it, in planning terms there are a number of clear things that were within scope for that which are effectively properties which are discounted below market level either for sale or for rent uh, and offered to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to access the market that's the simplest definition i hope that works for you sue in terms of planning law um but in practice uh most of the affordable housing we support through planning um is that uh, affordable rent which is capped at 80 percent of market rent and we try and cap that within local housing allowance rates which is an, another dimension of this that's slightly outside of planning but it's relevant or alternatively some sub Submarket home ownership options such as shared ownership, which is the most accessible um, home ownership options. But the the move to first homes will impact on that because there's an expectation that a minimum proportion of a site would go for that type of product, which is slightly more expensive. Sorry, that's probably too much detail. You shouldn't have asked a housing geek. <laughs> Actually, it is in our um, in our market in our um, supplementary planning document for affordable housing. That is in there as well. Well, could I just make a comment on that? Really, I, I, my concern is obviously that that affordability is really driven by the private market. And if you have a year like we're having now in the private market, the house prices are going up 10, 15, 20 percent whatever, that 80% of something in no way reflects actually affordability because no way has anybody's income has gone up 8, 10 or 15%. So I don't disagree with that. No. So it just becomes a sort of a figure, which is, well, is it really affordable? I'm not criticising you. You know, it just all becomes one of these figures. It's not really affordable. It's even less affordable, you know, which is above the line. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think, yeah, that's helpful. Thank, thank you, Claire. I think, that, yeah, there is a there is an issue around affordability, um, 
And I, I think this consultation, well, rather the government's ambition for the ARC is about building more homes to bring, uh, to, to sort of make available more properties, which in theory should reduce the price. That doesn't necessarily work. I appreciate that. But that was the sort of philosophy behind this in the first place, from my recollection. So it'll be interesting to see if that does happen, if 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 a considerable number of homes is built in the area. Um, there was one other thing I, I don't know if um, I can just raise, because I think Councillor Diane Moles asked a question regarding garden communities. And I'm happy to bring back a sort of paragraph or two on that. I mean, there's no detail of that in this document, because as I said, it's only a, a sort of vision document at the moment. But presumably at the next stage, when they start looking at options for growth, they will identify where you could bring forward significant new settlements, um, either existing uh, adjacent to existing urban areas or standalone settlements within the ARC area. And I, I do think that that will happen, particularly as they are looking to provide this significant rail link between Oxford and Cambridge. They will be looking at putting sustainable growth along that rail link, I believe. But I can do a bit more for members on that just to explain that a bit further. Unit. Oh, it's gone. It didn't the first time. I think that explains it because we wondered if there was any more because what we were told there was a couple and we wondered if that would be, you know, a lot more. But if it's going to be more the next stage that we will actually learn of what they're proposing doing, I think I think that that's enough. I think that's all we wanted to do. It was just a case of if you found out there was more than just a couple that was being identified at this point in time. Um, David, do you want to make, I think we should make a comment to the exec that covers what you said about skills and possibly uh, about emphasising local jobs for local people, you know, that all what we've just said about Luton, you're far better with words than I am. <laughs> I think that, that there has been a misunderstanding of um, where I was going with this high skilled, high salary jobs held by people who don't live in Luton. A lot of them are held by people who did live in Luton. And once they've got to a position where they can afford it, they can't wait to move out. That's the problem. That That's where the problem lies. Why don't these people want to live in Old Bedford Road or some of the posher bits of Wigmore or, or, or Round Green Sunset Drive. Why don't they want to live in their lovely houses, good neighbours? But they don't. They want to go to Harpenden. They want to go to St Albans. Or they want to live even further away. And quite apart from the ecological damage done by their commuting, they're, they're not helping Luton because they're not spending their time and their money here. But why don't they? Why don't they want to? What do we need to do to make them want to live here? That's the question that needs to be addressed. Um, and it, you know, it, the town centre was an area we were talking about only um, a, a short time ago. That's, that's part of the problem, isn't it? But there must be bigger issues than that. But if I, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is some someone trying to address the question, why does someone born and bred and educated in Luton, as soon as they arrive at a high paid, high skilled job where they can afford to, can't wait to move out of the town? That's a question that needs to be answered. Well, I think we know a lot of the answers to that, David. But how we solve, I mean, one of the answers is that people tend to live where they feel their location reflects them. And they wear their location, their home and where they live as, as a, almost like a coat of a reflection of where they feel they've got to in life. And people do not see Luton as aspirational. And not only do they not see it as aspirational, 
they don't see it as affordable because one of the reasons you mentioned those areas david but they're they're very expensive and a lot of the people that are moving to those houses now are clubbing together as families to do it the pattern and they're pushing the prices up if you look at some of the prices you know over a million pounds on old bedford road now for houses the only people that could afford them are where families club together and buy together nobody could afford it even in the best of jobs um so i think it's all about people's feel about that and i think the town center's part lack of theater lack of culture lack of facilities all of that is why people see they need to to move out but it's a huge problem huge problem that if you look at the demographic of luton now compared with 50 years ago it's totally changed in terms of not a, a social strata you know the middle class used to live alongside the working class in the, in the 1950s and 60s that doesn't happen now as they they get out as soon as they can so i think it's about feel really do we want to make a comment to the exec is my question or are we just quite happy to to be perfectly honest i can't think of anything no I... we could say that would, would actually help to get closer to solving the problem um, and Nicola's desperate to come in here, so maybe she's got... <laughs> yes, maybe Nicola, got, yeah. I'm just trying to turn that sentiment on its head in, in a sense, because I think we've kind of said some significant issues that have, have, have kind of have been raised, but actually should the should the um, recommendation to, be the, to the executive be something around the ARC investing in Luton as, as, a, as, a, as a, one of their significant you know, deprived urban places with with a whole range of challenges, which we recognise as, as a local authority. And, and so turn it on its head in, in yeah. a sense. So actually our rec executive's recommendation would be to to project forward something to the ARC to ensure, going back to both Councillor Wynne and Councillor Hussain's point around equality and, and ensuring that our place is elevated in the ARC, that there is attention and investment from government to do that. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, that's fine. I'd be quite happy with that. Yeah. yeah. Nicola, would you like to write that? Yeah, <laughs> I just want to do something offline with, um, yeah, with you. Yeah. So that would, that would fit into this consultation. Oh yes, we can certainly put something into our response, even if it's just a cut in within the covering response. But yeah, we can feed that back in absolutely. Right then, thank you very much, Sue, and Claire for helping out on my question. <laughs> right, so we're going to do a comment to the draft res response, which Nicola is going to raise with you, Eunice. Right. Hmm? That's the next one. Yeah. Now for the next item ten. Clear it. Oh, Colin, you've joined us. <laughs> but it's clear that's doing the presentation. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Councillor Pedersen. Um so uh, I um, just wanted to share with the overview and scrutiny board the uh, current draft of uh, a revised housing assistance policy. Um, I've got a quick presentation, so I thought it would be easier than working through the whole document and it had pulled out the main highlights, so I thought that would be useful. Um, so just to be really clear about what exactly we're looking at, because um, the housing assistance policy is quite a discrete piece of work um, and it relates to financial support provided to, on the whole, private households in their homes, for works in their homes. And uh, we include in there the bulk of the work under this policy is actually statutory uh, it's disabled facilities grants. Uh, but we also have under the regulatory reform order uh, an option and a power to provide discretionary funding and we do currently have a, a range of discretionary funding streams 
several of which are also focused around adaptations work outside of the statutory grants, plus there are other discretionary funding streams, for example, around uh, energy efficiency, empty homes, uh, poor housing quality and so on. But in order to do the discretionary uh, support, we have to have it guided by a published policy. And this is an update to the one that we currently have, which was last reviewed in 2007. Um, and we were asked to update it as part of our housing strategy, which is where this is coming now. Um, so uh, just a quick summary of kind of who who's covered by this. So for disabled facilities grants, um, it's in any household except for council tenants because council tenants are not eligible for a DFG and we do have uh, council funding for those homes. Um, and then with the other forms of support, uh, which is the discretionary support, they're mainly private homeowners on low incomes, although there is some assistance which is open to private tenants and tenants of other social landlords outside of the council. And the type of work, as I said, that we cover is adaptations work, some of which is mandatory, some of which is discretionary, some top up support work around energy efficiency, uh, loans to support extensions or loft conversions for overcrowded households. Uh, and we're making this more explicit now around supporting uh, looked after children, uh, loans and support for empty homes and also to improve poor quality homes. And that's what we're putting in. That, that's pretty much an evolution rather than a revolution of what we currently have in our existing policy. Um, but just want to talk you through the things that are different. Um, so although most of the most of the types of support are the same, we have made some changes to the maximum amounts for each type of uh, assistance. That sort of reflects changes in prices over the time that the previous policy was agreed. Uh, we've changed the, some of the priority order to prioritise, for example, the energy efficiency work slightly higher in the, um, in the list on, in view of our approach to uh, zero carbon. And we've changed some of the rules around eligibility, in particular around kind of definitions uh, of low income, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, we... Gave, we've given a lot greater promise, prominence to supporting uh, corporate parenting. Um, and that's absolutely a reflection of what members have been telling us since we started looking at some of this through the housing strategy in 2018. Um, and so we have been very much more explicit in the new policy around how this can support um, people who want to foster or adopt children. Uh, it, it's not like it's not available now, but it's making it a lot more explicit. Um, so that that hopefully provides a lot more clarity. Um, and we, as I say, we've we've put energy efficiency work further up the priority, and we've given we've changed the rules so it's it's a broader range of support. Um, at the moment, our our support is mainly focused around sort of boilers and hot wet wet hot water systems. Um, obviously, with the changes coming in terms of phasing out of boilers and things like that, there are other forms of energy efficiency support that we can that we can help with, and we wanted to have that a bit broader. Um, and we've updated some of the arrangements around the empty homes support, uh, which we hope uh, might improve take up, uh, but it's only a very small part of our empty homes broader um, action. So the the thing I mentioned about eligibility. Um, at the moment, the discretionary grants were subject to a sort of, um, it's mainly for people who are on income related benefits, and then there was a sort of financial threshold, which was incredibly low. Um, we know that with the Luton 2040 work that's been going on, there's been some really fantastic analysis locally about what does our, what does the minimum income standard look like? Uh, as divided by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, uh, and we looked at the minimum income standard for Luton and what that means locally, uh, and we thought it was an opportunity to then embed that in some of the broader policy of the council. So we are taking a definition of low income, which is based on that work that the um, business intelligence team has done for Luton 2040. So that brings low income households below uh, certain financial thresholds into scope for this support. Um, it's this only for the discretionary support, though, because we can't control the thresholds for the disabled facilities grant that's set by government. Um, and we've also changed the way that we look at loan support, because although at the moment we can offer support as a loan, um, in practice, it's not 
operated very effectively. And we think it makes more sense to be a lot clearer about this, where we're providing support to a homeowner uh, that's adding value to the property or, um, you know, it's an investment for them. It's effectively a no interest loan, uh, which we can recover through a charge on the property, can be repaid at any time and can be repaid at the point when the property is sold in the future, um, which helps to create a recyclable fund. I mean, it's going to be a long term recyclable fund. It's not going to suddenly kind of flood back in, but it creates a, a recyclable fund for the future uh, rather than providing simply grant assistance. Um, so where we are now is we have an iteration now, which I'm still working on adaptations uh, for the uh, executive committee on the uh, 11th of October. Um, and then we will be taking it to public consultation uh, and engaging with some key stakeholders around that. Uh, and the aim would be to then a final version that would come back through members um, sort of towards the end of the year, beginning of next year, uh, so that we could adopt from the 1st of April. Uh, and I just wanted to put a quick slide in to show how, you know, it's a comparatively small amount of money. Um, it's just under two million a year in terms of our investments, but it's supporting uh, key points across all five of our key areas in Luton 2040. Uh, everything from child friendly town to the uh, protecting disadvantaged, green and sustainable, so on. So, um, you know, it's 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 a small amount of money. Uh, it's quite a niche area of work, but it does have a lot of positive outcomes across our ambitions around 2040 um, and as I say it's it's an update of the policy that we have now that we wanted to just um, you know bring up to date so that's just a quick whiz through the kind of key things that it covers and what's new I'm happy to take questions though. Any questions? Yes Councillor Franks. Yeah um, reading through the presentation ahead of the meeting it wasn't clear to me exactly what the objective was in updating the policy but that Claire's answered most of those questions um, in the presentation so thank you for that I'm only left with with one question now and that is final document approved by members is that an executive function or does it go to full council as part of the council's overarching policy please I genuinely don't know the answer to that, but I will find out before we get to that stage. <laughs> um, Colin, you have a... Yeah, if you, if you could um, perhaps circulate an email with the answer when you've got it. It's, My assumption it's, council's I, open. Yeah, it's not, that really, it's not a housing question, is it? It's an, a legal admin question. My assumption, council, is that it's an executive decision. Um, it's housing policy. Um, so I don't, I don't believe it's a full council um, decision, but we'll get that checked and we'll get back to you. Thank you. Councillor Chapman. Uh, my understanding of what you said is that the budget is two million a year. Is that right? Uh, it's, I think, 1.95 <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And are we spending that every year? Is it because I would have thought it's actually quite sometimes difficult to spend this money. Is that all being spent up to? Budget. Yeah, pretty much. Um, e even last year, where we had a quite a hiatus in the delivery of disabled facilities grants for obvious reasons, most of those were shielding households. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there, there wouldn't be a problem in allocating the funds. And that is a fixed fund coming from government, is it? We get government support towards the disabled facilities grants through Better Care Fund yeah. monies. Um, but my understanding is that there is um, there's an input from the council as well. Yeah, I do, the reason I wonder, I heard an article on the radio, the government spouting in the week about how private landlords could apply for grants to um, facilitate their properties for disabled people. And I wasn't sure was that through this or was this additional money that the government was saying the private landlords could claim through some other grant. Do you know what that was? It's possible that uh, tenants of private landlords would be eligible for disabled facilities grants. They would need the permission of the landlord. Yeah. Um, so it's based on the person needing the work. But that would, would that come through our money? 
or would that be is that some other money that government was spouting about they would be eligible for disabled facilities grants it's usually getting the landlord to give the permission for the works is yeah. the problem the reason i ask is that in this article it was saying oh isn't it shocking that all these yeah. private landlords don't know they can apply for this grant to be able to get their properties well fat lot of use that is if there's no money anyway so it just seemed a bit i couldn't work out whether it was spin or whether it was something we'd missed I'm not aware of any additional funding being made available specifically for that, no. Yeah. Colin, do you want to? Yeah, so, so Councillor, so far to the end of July, um, the Council, this is Council Housing Revenue Account, um, we spent nearly 47,000 on adaptions um, uh, for uh, people with disabilities and for the disabled facilities grants that that specifically Claire was talking about um to the end of july we spent nearly thirty-seven thousand. that will catch up and if you don't mind me just giving you a few figures just to help with a little bit of understanding we've got about 70 cases council tenants are waiting for adaptions um so that's a, that's the waiting list and for disabled facilities grants, we've got 136 households waiting for adaptions. Now, that's 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 probably about a two-year wait. Um, and I recently heard that adults adults uh, social services have got some more resources for OTs. And the problem with if you get more OTs, you push the cases through faster. If we don't have more resources at that end, people wait longer. And it's, it's unfortunately it's very typical in councils that DFGs, people with disabilities wait roughly a year and a half uh, for adaptions because the whole process takes a very long time from OT, specifying what works to be done, passed over to housing, um, getting, getting, for example, stair lift um, procured through a tender process can take a long time, two years sometimes. Can I just make one more point? Yes, certainly. Um, my concern with a lot of this work in the past was that it was being done for elderly people and then eventually, you know, it was just scrapped. Um, I've had this experience with my parents recently trying to offer the adaptions equipment that they had in their house. Nobody's interested. Just get scrapped. I knew of a lady that the council put a lift in her, a literally a, a full lift in the house. It was never used. And that was just lost. So I, I, in my ideal world, more of this money would be focused at youngsters, where it's younger people that need adaptions. And I think it's a big weakness that we don't have more work going on. I shouldn't say like central beds have and providing places like prior review and things like that, which is proper adaptive accommodation that has a, an afterlife, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, it is a concern that what happens to this equipment after people pass on particularly when it's older people. The, the issue of equipment is a, is a really valid one because if we give, if we install equipment in someone's home, essentially it's their equipment yeah. and they're responsible for fixing it, repairing it, etc, etc. It's an area of work that I need to get my head around yeah. a little bit more, but you're right. Um, sometimes those adaptions aren't suitable for other people yeah. and it ends up getting taken out and and, and scrapped. Yeah, it's, the part it's just sad, really, because there's a lot of money invested in that. Anyway, something else we should look at. Just to add that the disabled facilities grants are you know, any, anyone who needs them is eligible at all ages, including children, so yeah. we give them for children as well. So, um, although the prevalence of the need for it will be higher in the older population. So, yeah. yeah. But I, I, my personal view is really, I'm not sure adapting people to their own names is the long-term right answer, actually. I think for younger people, where it is a bit of life there, we need other ways of bringing older people into the part of our next Any other questions? Quickly. Oh, sorry, Paul's Malik. Yeah, thank you very much, Claire, for this report. Uh, in my personal opinion, we needed this report or policy to increase as the quality in Luton because we are all aware that after after the COVID, a lot of people are struggling uh, in terms of uh, finances and everything. And uh, also we are working towards our 2020 and 2040 um, policy as well. 
Uh, uh, my question is, um, I just want to know how much amount we are going to give the eligible people. Is there any exact amount for this 20, 30, 40, thousand, something like that? So how much do you go to give to? The, in, in eligible people, they are going to ask for grants. So how much amount we go? Uh, we I just I just uh, looking at your paper. You said that there are going to be different amounts this this time. Amounts, the money. Council, we're struggling to hear the question. So actually, I'm asking. You know, the amounts are going to be given to eligible people. Are they different from the past? So, are you saying uh, you are going to give a specific grant like twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand for specific reasons? Yes. Yeah, so, um, there was a maximum amount for uh, all the different grants. It's in the appendix of the policy document. So. Um, we have increased the maximum amount for various types of grants. So, for example, the uh, extensions and uh, loft, you know, loft, loft conversions and extensions um, has increased to 40,000. Um, it's currently 30,000 and it's sometimes hard to get work done for that amount of money. Um, and so some of those, some of the amounts have gone up to reflect uh, some of the, just the changes in costs in the seven years since the policy was last updated. But obviously it's the maximum. It's not like a guaranteed amount for everyone. It depends on the works. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Any comments that we want to add? No. Thank you very much, Claire and Colin. Um, before we go on to the work programme, members of the committee, um, this OSB briefing note on Central Bedfordshire Local Plan, inspectors report and adoption. We've had that just as a briefing note. Anybody got any questions on it? Are you quite happy with what we've had? You're looking at me puzzled. I printed this off. I, well, I, I was, I, I was actually going to make a suggestion um, when we got to the work program, but I guess since you've raised it now, we could record our thanks for a very comprehensive report. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I was just thinking, am I the only one? <laughs> yes, it was. I did have a few questions, but I'll actually ask because it's specific to the M1 A6. She's just disappeared. <laughs> I thought she might. <laughs> she knew I was coming. <laughs> no, she knows me and my M1 across to A6 road. But I just wondered if anybody, as I say, it was, I found it a very good briefing. Um, I just wondered if anybody had any questions that we that they wanted to raise with Sue, and I would raise on your behalf. That's all. No. Nope. Right, thank you. We will know. If we could record uh, in the minutes, our uh, uh, grateful thanks for yes. a, for a really informative report because it, it was. I agree. Yes. Chair Sarah, Sarah Barker put that report together, so I'll um I'll also thank her on behalf of the committee. Yes, thank you. Right, on to the work programme. David, did you have anything that you would? I've got a couple of things to suggest for the work. But first of all, on the 22nd of November meeting, we are scheduled for Sue Frost's implications of the adoption of Central Beds Plan. Well, we've got it, but it raises a question which might well come back to the um, 22nd of November meeting, and that is there's a consultation on the draft allocations scheme. That's the bit that I want. Which is a big issue as far as Luton is concerned. Um, and that's due for a consultation which ends around about the 13th of January. 
I'm assuming that it will go to executive for approval prior to that date, probably to the 6th of December meeting of executive. Um, if it does, then that draft response could come to our 22nd of November meeting before it goes to executive. I think it'd be interesting to look at. Yes, I think so as well. Because it's a much, much more important issue for Luton than it appears to be for central beds. Definitely for Luton North. Any councillors in Luton North, yes. And if everybody's happy with that, I've got one other suggestion yes. for, for a subject that we might want to have a look at. What yeah, the um, refugees. Um, it, it's beginning to become clear that the numbers of refugees coming into the town are on, they're not all from um, Afghanistan. Um, they're coming from all sorts of other places. Um, and I just think it's time for us to have a look at a number of issues, like what, what's the current accommodation that um, they're being offered? I, I gather it's uh, hotels uh, paid for by the Home Office, but, uh, you know, are, are they in suitable accommodation? What are their future prospects? Um, what, what's the government's intention? Does the government intend for them to settle permanently in Luton or are they going to be pretty much forcibly dispersed? Um, how, how many unaccompanied children are amongst them and need particular uh, care, obviously? Um, so, yeah, I think there are lots of questions around the numbers of refugees the town is is taking and uh, and the way that they're being cared for and looked after and what are their long-term prospects um I, lots of questions and not terribly not an awful lot of information um we we, we might even um want to go and have a look at some of the accommodation that they're in to sit because we've seen on, on some television reports that refugees in some places are put in awful places um uh, and and places where uh, nasty right-wing head-banging nutcases can go and make their life even more unpleasant than than it already is and we, we clearly want to avoid that uh, so so i just think it's an area we could we could have a look at um i noticed that colin and claire are both still here did you want to add anything, Colin, or are you just interested in listening to what we're actually saying? Yeah. Um, being realistic, would you be able to pull the information? I, I, I'm jumping the gun here. Uh, it's what Eunice would ask you the question is how long would it take you to pull the information? So I think What's practical? So, so just um, for members' information, I think you've had a briefing note, haven't you, from Adam Divney? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of the core information that's that's known. I think the point that Councillor Franks is making are really good points, actually, because yeah. there are lots of unknowns from the Home Office currently. So we've got a number, a volume of refugees in the borough that are in hotels and they're being supported through that process. Um, in terms of what that looks like in, for the medium term, there's still a question mark there. So it's all being directed through the Home Office. They happen to be in Luton because we happen to have hotels in, in Luton being an airport town. Um, so, so there is quite a lot of work happening, um, but I think it's a really good topic for scrutiny to, to scrutinise um, I think I, I agree with, with with Colin. I think it is it is a good topic because I think um, you know it would be a great task and finish topic. Yeah. But I, I don't know whether we've got the resource to do that. But Adam Divney would be the person who would who would pull the report together. I think if um, I think you want a really insightful report. So I think there is a lot of work happening in terms of just understanding kind of what the needs are of the community that are in Luton, that are in the hotel. So I think we're still working through the health, 
the education and all of the needs um, within, within that group. I think once that's known and once we get a response from the Home Office around support, then I think that's a that's a better position to come back to scrutiny. And I think there's too many question marks for an immediate report in October. Um, but we could do a holding report and then you could have it as a as a follow on for a future. Well, what about, you know, we could do a holding report for the. What about the 22nd? Oh, no, that looks. Well, it, it might be interesting. Uh, Anna, to have a, a, a report that, if, if even if all it does is to give us the bones and some yeah. statistics and outline some of the outstanding questions. That, 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 yeah, if that. we had that, then we could then look to see whether a task and finish group would be more effective mm -hmm. than us asking questions here that we could go and visit. You know, we could do it a lot more justice by doing a task and finish group, but if we had that sort of bare bones, um, we could then make the decision from there on how much we want to actually investigate. And we could either bring it back to the October or we've got, we've got one the uh, 22nd of November. We don't need to decide today. I'm sure no, that, um, it's, it's that Angela and the team will slot it in when they uh, discuss it with the officers. But uh, Javiria Hussain's got something to say. Any other things that anybody wants? Yes, Peter. On the birth of you've got the child to pay to the bank of the state agency. Just so that we make sure that we're everything that job's doing. You can make it there where you've also um, and the of the time. I think Angela is. So, of course, for the current legislation, where we're at, what the level of fines very available and where people are banned. That all? Sorry. That's it. Yes, Colin. Thank you. Right. Anybody else want to add anything to the? Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.